So I'm delighted to be here, uh, and uh, as a Kiwi, uh, I'm not going to mention rugby at all. Oh, good. <laughs> Two of us against the rest of them will win easily. Um, <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is to talk about the motivation for uh, the state infrastructure and then talk about the um, conceptual framework within which we're operating. And then we've heard a lot of, about metrics and, and how data might get used. What I thought I would do is to talk a little bit about how the data infrastructure uh, can get used uh, in terms of fostering science, in terms of improving management, and in terms of documenting results, and then talk a little bit about what might come next. Uh, so uh, what Norman pointed out was, was a very good point. Uh, the, the motivation behind this is to build a uh, scientific basis for science policy. So the um, project in the United States was driven very much by Jack Marburger's uh, point that we didn't have a scientific basis for science policy. In other words, what he said was that we didn't have a theoretical or a um, empirical infrastructure in order to answer a lot of the questions that have been pointed out, like uh, how much do I spend in area X or what do I do in area Y? Um, and obviously, the reason you want a scientific basis for science policy is if what we're interested in doing, both as funding agencies and as part of the research system, is to foster good science. I think that's really important. We're not about trying to figure out uh, counting things, what we're trying to do is to figure out what makes good scientific activity and foster that. And because what you measure is what you get, you better be very careful about what you measure and have it based in some uh, scientific foundations. And obviously related to that is improving management. And uh, kind of a, what to me was a secondary goal, but has turned out to be a very big goal for uh, heads of science agencies and VCs for research and so on, is established credibility and documenting impact. Uh, in other words, the, there's been a real challenge with, uh, in, at least in the United States, and from what I can gather in other countries, where you tell, say you've done all kinds of wonderful things, and the anecdotes kind of start to run thin after a while. And the, the challenge that we faced when we started thinking about how to build the data infrastructure was, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm an economist by training. Um, I came into this field about four or five years ago. One of the things that was quite surprising to me was the manual nature of the way in which the data were collected, uh, heavy manual reporting by researchers with relatively low quality as a result. And of course, uh, really not any sense of what the long-term results of science investments were because the scientists themselves aren't going to know that. So um, use 21st century technologies. We heard a lot yesterday about cyber infrastructure and the potential for capturing uh, data automatically, electronically. Almost all electronic and financial and economic transactions are electronically available now. Use that and use the new technologies to piece information together and do it in an open and transparent way so that human beings, the scientists, can correct it or provide input into the way in which um, the data are captured. So get the engagement of the researcher community. So that, that's kind of the bottom line. And the key notion here is to uh, develop the appropriate behavioral micro foundations. So metrics that are developed in the absence of uh, the ca cable to the, to the engine don't make a whole lot of sense. It's hard to know how to, when you see a set of metrics, it's hard to understand what the policy levers are if you don't understand what the behavioral unit of analysis is. So the, the notion that we started from is that the appropriate behavioral unit of analysis to look at 
is the scientists and the individual scientists. They're the ones who do science. The talking about the results of grants doesn't mean anything. Grants don't do anything. Scientists are the ones who do science. Grants are the intervention that change the way in which scientists behave. And then you can look at the products, and when I say products, broadly defined, economic, social, scientific, workforce product. But the, the behavioral micro foundation has to start with the individual. So that's the core insight. And of course, the challenge is as much of the data sit in different pieces parts. So universe information on grants sit typically in the funding agencies. And they're typically siloed. So at least in the United States, there are 17 different funding agencies, 17 different systems. Actually, more than that, because the Department of Energy in its own right has 35 different systems that don't talk to each other. Uh, and then you've got different researcher IDs and so on. The information on the people, the individuals who do the science sit in the research institutions. And when I say people, I don't just mean the principal investigators. It's the postdocs, the graduate students, the undergraduate students. That sits in the research institutions. And the products that they produce, the outputs, the publications sit in a various uh, publication clearinghouses. The patents sit in the USPTO or the International Patent Office. Richard Jefferson's done a great job of uh, pulling those data together. And uh, Paul Jensen at the University of Melbourne has been working on this as well. Um, the, uh, where the students go sit in administrative records, often in tax data or in census data. But all of the data exist electronically. Okay. Now, the key thing, too, is that if you just look at um, each of these separately, you're not going to get a sense of the system. And what you have to understand is that there's a dynamic interrelationship. So these arrows go in multiple ways, and you need the linkages, not just looking at them each in isolation. So what approach, I know I've only got 30 minutes, so um, what approach did we use to automatically start to capture information on, on the individuals? And, and structure this. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. We've developed a portfolio explorer. We automatically capture data on individuals through the HR records of uh, the universities and capture um, information on the, we started uh, using the, the patent database um, in the US. So very interesting, the, notion, the question that we just had about uh, how do you describe science? How do you, how do you get, uh, information about what science is being done, what science is being funded by grants. Uh, what we did was we brought computer scientists together and, and used natural language processing and topic modeling to identify what research is being done using the words of the scientists themselves. So Kai, your question's exactly on point. You don't need to use keywords, you use clusters of co-occurring words that occur naturally from the text and so as new words come up, new and emerging ideas get captured through the topic modeling approach. Um, how do you, so you can automatically capture the information that is embodied in the text from using new cyber infrastructure approaches, cyber tools. How do you capture uh, information on economic outcomes? So these are all examples. Uh, what you do is the PTO data, the, the Patent and Trademark Office data, is uh, information about each patent, but within those patents is information on who filed, so you can create longitudinal information on the people who filed for patents, and within the patents you have citations to um, the non-patent literature as well as, as to previous patents. All of that can be harvested and used analytically without a single PI, uh, principal investigator, having to link the information. And I should say, both of these approaches that I've highlighted did not come from federal bureaucracy. They came from the research community, right? So relying on the research community is, is part of it. Uh, similarly, how do you capture information about what researchers have been doing? 
Uh, one way of doing it is to have them manually fill out forms and then they disappear into the great moor of the government bureaucracy. The other way is to recognize <coughs> the information is hiding in plain sight. Every academic researcher has their CV on the web because they want to be seen. And if you uh, take a look at what each university, certainly a number of universities in Australia have, uh, at universities in Japan and starting to build it in the United States is automated CV harvesting. You can capture the information on what they've been doing without making them physically fill out forms for the government. So let's talk about some applications here because I just want to uh, give you a sense of how, when you build the data infrastructure, how can you use it to answer key science policy questions? And I told you I'd walk through three of them. First one is uh, describe scientific investments. So what we did is uh, we threw, as I said, the, the computer scientists against 200,000 NSF proposal description. This can be applied to any text corpus. And what uh, was done was they generated these topic models. Uh, so generated 1,000 detailed topics, and you may not be able to see it up the back, but essentially, the topics were classified according to the words that were generated in the text. And so then you can automatically generate how many proposals, how many dollars were, were spent on each one. Because the topic models can go across agencies, you can apply the same topic modeling to NSF and to NIH data, to USDA, to EPA, and then you can see the overlap in areas across, uh, across agencies. So NIH specific topic, for example, are um, a lot of diseases, right? Uh, a lot of this area, if you take a look at this, is biochemistry. And a lot of this area over here is uh, computer science engineering, which is the topic areas. So you can get a sense of uh, science investments across the board. Uh, you can also use the topic uh, models because you can topic model the publications, the, the grants, and then uh, topic model publication. This is obviously very aggregate data. You can do it at the micro level as well. You can get a sense of emerging areas, uh, new, work, new topics that are, that are coming up, and then relate it to publications coming up. So, so that's the notion of how to link, um, you get the information about the grants, you see how that, which people are supported, and then start tying that to scientific products, and that gives you a sense of the assessment. So you, for example, here you've got the investment in a particular area, you identify the PIs who are working in that area, and then tie it to the individual publications at the micro level, and that gives you a sense of the strength of that policy lever, notice that these publications could have a substantial time lag, but you're able to capture that over time. And then you've got the, you've got the links between the publications and the grants, not at an aggregate level where the direction of correlation, I'm not going to say causality, right? The direction of correlation is unclear, but because you've got the link to the, to the individuals. So how can these things, uh, this approach, how is it also starting to be used to do better science management? Um, we heard a little bit about finding reviewers, but finding reviewers based not on keywords, but on topic areas uh, uh, that, are, that are developed out of the, um, out of the uh, text that's used both in proposals and publications and you're able to identify where they are geographically, so you've got to, you start to get at a democratization of research. Um, I was at NSF for four years. The way in which we typically found reviewers or invited people to workshops, you went down the hall and you said, uh, do you know who'd be good on this workshop or in this panel? So it's the, the incestuous nature of that is everything sits in people's heads, and you don't bring in new ideas and new people because you li literally don't know who they are. And building a system like this where you can uh, 
use, as I said, 21st century technologies in order to do better science management uh, pushes you forward. Um, we heard yesterday about the challenges with, with getting the appropriate panel reviews. There's an ad hoc selection process. Uh, this tool is being used now and being developed by the energy, uh, sorry, engineering um, directorate so that rather than having a relatively ad hoc way of identifying reviewers uh, and panelists, you can describe the research topic areas that the researchers have been involved in. You can do the topic modeling of the proposals that come in for a particular panel, and then you can do the overlap and the match, and you've got the geographic information. And then you can figure out which proposals ought to be assigned to which reviewers based on their topic area of expertise uh, rather than the, the relatively ad hoc approach that we've been using now. So you can see how the tool can be used. And in a related uh, approach, you can get a sense of your portfolio because what you're able to do is you're able to see how many proposals have been awarded in a particular topic area by science area, what, what the decline rate has been, what the growth rate has been in proposals versus awards and so on. The last topic was established credibility and documenting results. So one of the things Jack used to say, I don't know how many of you knew Jack, he, he ended up being a co-author of mine, he's one of my few heroes, he's just a, a wonderful man. Um, but you know, the answer in too many cases, when you're asking how much should be spent in science policy, we heard yesterday, 4% R and, you know, people were spending, countries were spending 2.5% R&D, and the comment was made, oh, it should be 4%. Why? There is no micro foundations that say that it should be 4%. Right? If it, there's, saying that it ought to be 4% immediately begs the question, upon what basis are you making that argument? And we have no theoretical basis to make the argument that investment in R&D should be 4%. It might be 4%. It might be 6%, it might be 2%, but we don't have a basis for saying that other than if you send more money, a miracle will occur. Stuff will happen. So how do we establish credibility in documenting results? Norman pointed out, we believe, I think everyone in the room believes, science is a very good thing. But starting a discussion of science policy with a assumption which is based on, predicated on belief rather than evidence is not having the effect that we would like in the halls of Congress. So one of the things that one, we're able to do is because we're able to now tie the topic areas with the students who are doing the work, we're now able to start to show, this is for a selected number of institutions, how many students we're training in different areas. We're able to say how many students, and we're able to say in which areas they're being trained. Not because a PI had to fill out a form, but automatically generated. We're also able to say what the distribution of employment is in this example on nanotech. How many faculty, how many graduate students, how many undergraduate students. We can also say, where did nanotech expenditures get spent? In other words, they bought computer equipment and supplies and uh, subcontracted to other institutions. One can automatically generate that information. Because we've set it up to map into the patent database, you can also document how many patents have been granted to NSF-funded researchers. Again, no causality statement here, but, but correlation not because anyone filled out a form, which obviously is going to result in undercounting, but automatically linked into the, into the database. So what that enables you to do is automatically pick up what patents have been granted, in what areas, who the 
uh, assignees were and click immediately and find out the uh, patent data office. So here again, you can have that micro foundation, link on the individual, the investment in nanotech, shows who's working in nanotech, and then the patents. Eventually, as some of the research in, in the US are, are pointing out, you can link it to the firms and the startup companies and so on by linking into census data. So this is my last slide. So what might come next? Uh, this is a nascent system that is being developed in the United States. Um, part of the discussion is to build it out internationally, build out an application programming interface so that the data are open to people to use and to the researcher community to provide input in and engage the researcher community rather than having a top-down identification of what needs to be done, have it be bottom-up uh, and uh, the ideas generate uh, out both, both out of the computer science, the domain community, and in particular, the social science community.